morning, church. Good to see you all here this morning. And if you'd uh, open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through chapter 11, verse 1. And uh, I'm not sure if you knew this, but uh, the verse and chapter of Scripture are not the inspired part of Scripture, so therefore, when we're looking at Scripture together, I, I don't necessarily feel constrained by the chapters and verses they've divided up into. And so, yes, we're, we're going to cover chapter 10 and chapter 11, verse 1 today. Uh, so hopefully those of you who are OCD, it doesn't drive you cra so crazy that you can't, you can't compartmentalize the, the Scripture we're looking at today. Uh, it, it's so good for us to be here together. Hey, I, I just wanted us to take a moment and I just want you to give yourself permission in this moment to just, just take a breath. And to, the world outside is just so busy. And do you ever just feel like you're just going from thing to thing, rushing from thing to thing to thing, and you just don't feel like you have enough time to just breathe, to take a moment and just breathe and just to be and to exist and to contemplate life and what's going on? Well, I, I, I hope uh, today as, as you sit under the Word of God that you can find that here this morning, just to take a moment, just to sit under the Word of God and just allow God and His Word to breathe life into you. So let's just take a moment here and just to, to breathe for a second. So why don't, we, uh, why don't we bow our heads in prayer and just in your mind, just be thinking about the Lord and be be praying to the Lord silently and just ask God for rest this morning. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning as thankful recipients of your salvation. We thank you, God, for giving us rest in the midst of chaos. Thank you, Lord, that our rest in you is not dependent on a specific day or time, but, God, that we have rest in you always, that in the midst of the storms of this life, we can turn to you and receive fullness of rest, peace that passes understanding, joy and pleasures forevermore. I ask this hour, God, as we look into your word, your God-breathed word that you've given us, and that we can find rest this morning in you and in, in your truth. Thank you for this precious time we get to spend together. We know that each moment we get together is a gift. So let us enjoy this time. Help Help our minds escape the busyness, the thoughts of what's waiting at home or at our workplace. But just let us enjoy this time of sanctuary and worship and fellowship and praise. That's a gift from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that you are enjoying the... Uh, the spring season so far, we got to spend some time with some friends yesterday, and that's why I wasn't at the uh, the trap shoot yesterday. I would have loved to come and show you all how it's done. Um, I know, I know. I'm, I'm uh, actually when I signed up for it, I, I put my level at a two level. Um, some of you put your level at like 16 out of five, I think. Because they asked, what's your experience level shooting guns? And it was between a one and a five, one being not experienced at all, five being pro. And uh, I, I think a few of you put 16 or 13 or something like that. But uh, no, I'm at about a two. I, I would have loved to have come and learned from some of you. But we had plans with some friends, and we were uh, spending time actually with the, the Lathrams on Saturday, which their home is located on the top of a, a hill on Bigelow Gulch, where... Um, there's a bunch of farmland up there, and so their home just overlooks just a beautiful landscape. You can see the skyline for miles. And so as we're spending time with our friends, we were just enjoying the, the variation of the clouds that were 
uh, just across the sky. And at one point, I noticed that there was very, very dark cumulus clouds uh, to the north in the Deer Park area, whereas where we were sitting, it was just pretty standard, light-looking clouds. And, and so I even got a, a, an alert on my phone which said, severe thunderstorms heading through Deer Park. So my, my heart and mind were with those of you who were trap shooting. Uh, but also, it, it got me to think that um, we had our kids that were outside that were playing in the farm area, and we, we were perfectly comfortable with that. We, were, we knew that they were safe. We, we could assess by the look of the clouds that there was no danger. Um, however, the, the men who were shooting quickly came to realize that danger is, is close, danger close. And so, uh, according to Jim and, and Chris, as that danger was getting closer, they all fled for the barn or under uh, different canopies or whatever to, to escape the potential danger of thunderstorms. But um, that got me thinking that not all clouds are the same, right? You, you can't lump every cloud into the same category. A, a certain type of cloud presents a certain type of danger where another type of cloud does not. And so what got me to think about this? Well, it got me to think about when I was a kid, uh, younger, um, specifically on the date of April 17, 1996. And the reason I remember this date is because a significant thing happened on this day. I was at the middle school in Deer Park. We lived a few blocks away. And as I often did, I went over there and I was shooting hoops on the baskets that were outside. And as I was playing basketball, all of a sudden just a storm just started heading our way. And um, rain started to fall, wind started to pick up, started to hear some thunder and lightning off in the distance. And as a young, naive, foolish, dumb kid, I just kept playing basketball. I kept shooting hoops. And the only reason I left is because the wind started to blow the ball uh, where I, I wasn't making many shots. At least that's the excuse I like to use. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to pack up and I'm going to run home. So I ran home the couple blocks, and when I got to the driveway, I remember there was a, a, a flash and then an immediate loud thunderous boom, the biggest explosion or sound that I've ever heard like that. And it was immediate. It was flash, boom, just like that. And so I thought, wow, that, that is, was very, very close. Went inside from the in safety of the inside of my house. I enjoyed the thunderstorm and watched it, went to bed that night. And then I woke up the next morning uh, to see on the news that a young man by the name of Ryan Hill was struck by lightning as he was walking on the train tracks uh, in Deer Park. And I, I knew immediately it was that flash boom that killed him. And it very easily could have been me who was struck by lightning that day as well. And so, what's the reason I bring that up? Well, a word that has been in my mind lately that I've heard a lot of people using and that I myself have been using is the word nuance. You guys familiar with that word? Any of you have that in your vernacular, nuance? Well, when I looked at the etymology of that word, the background of that word. It was a word that was formed in 1781, and it's French, and its meaning is slight difference or shade of color, and specifically when you break apart the word, it has to do with clouds. The, the word cloud is in the French word nuance. And so ultimately, the word nuance means the different colors of clouds. So it's something I, I didn't know, and I thought, with, with all these things that I'm thinking of, the experiences that we've had, thinking back on April 17th, 1996, it just made me think about the nuances in our Christian life. That part of Christian maturity is learning how to differentiate the gray, dark, cumulus thunderstorm clouds from the regular clouds. And so... As a parent, when I'm thinking about my children and whether I'm going to be okay with them playing outside, I assess with nuance the, the difference of the clouds. Or if I'm going to be with other men shooting, uh, doing trap shooting with, with shotguns, if there's dark clouds coming with thunder and lightning, 
I'm, I'm going to assess with nuance what's a good time to go inside and seek shelter. And this has everything to do with what we're going to talk about today because the Apostle Paul in the last few chapters has been talking about this very thing, that God has given us liberty within our, within our Christian life, liberty to live this life, but not to sin, uh, liberty to in, enjoy wonderful meals together, to, to be in the world and enjoy all the fruits of this life that this life has to offer, the fruits of fellowship, the, the fruits of invention and creation. But yet there's a line somewhere that we need to be wise enough to know when it crosses into sin. But sometimes the Bible isn't abundantly clear about, about where that line is. The Bible simply tells us idolatry is a sin, sexual immorality is a sin. Well, that doesn't answer every single question that we have. And so within the Christian life, there are certain gray areas or gray clouds that require his wisdom for us to be able to make nuance and nuanced decisions. And so as we walk through this text today, I want you to keep in mind the definition of that word nuance. I want you to keep in mind uh, the difference between light clouds and thunderous clouds because that, that will help us to understand what Paul is trying to express to the Corinthian church and what God is trying to express to us here this morning. So if your Bibles are open, let's start with chapter 10, verse 14, which Paul continues, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider, consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the, of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Well, let's continue on to verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own, own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of what of that which I give thanks? Continuing on to verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So let's go back and work through these passages and look exactly what Paul is trying to say, what God is trying to say to the church. First of all, Paul makes a definitive statement in verse 14. And this is a culmination of all the other arguments that he has brought up. He ultimately says, flee from idolatry. He's laying the groundwork of his explanation by declaring the fact that we, are, we as believers should have absolutely no part in the practice of idolatry. That is the worship of other gods or the images of God or other gods. And on this basis, every believer should be able to say amen. Right? As believers in Jesus Christ, we worship only one God. And so every believer agrees upon that fact. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, 15, 
tells us, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. So this is a uniting statement that we worship one God, one God alone. And as believers, we stand upon that principle that is a hill worth dying on for all of us. And Paul's message here, he says in verse 15, is for sensible people. In other words, people who can make those judgments on their own. They're, They're not relying on someone else to tell them to make that judgment. As a believer, they are sensible and wise enough to know idolatry is sinful and not for the believer. Sensibility, the Greek word there is front, phronimos, which refers to those who have a practical wisdom. Now, some people have a studious wisdom. They're really good at studying, and they're really good at facts and figures and numbers. But yet, when it comes to translating that into practical living, they really struggle. And that's why a lot of them sit in some ivory tower or stay in their office, because if they go out in the world, they don't know how it translates into practical living. And so there is a difference between sensible wisdom and, let's say, book smart wisdom. And so the sensible person understands the difference between idolatry and, let's say, use the example Paul is using, and whether you're eating meat that perhaps along the preparation process was prepared um, for idols or something like that. And so Paul is calling on all sensible people to consider what he is saying. And knowing that the Corinthian people were indeed sensible people, that they were really uh, wrestling and trying to explore what, uh, where, where does doctrine meet practical living? Where does it go from just simply the head knowledge of theology to everyday life? And so they were wrestling with this. Sometimes they were failing, but they were truly, I believe, seeking the truth on these matters. Where, where are the safe places to play as Christians? And so Paul then makes a case for cautious participation. And he uses a few examples here to give us an idea of, of why that's important. And why that's important is because of our communion together, our fellowship, our unity together. And he begins by starting with a, a Gentile example. And the Gentile example he uses is communion. And we, we take communion here at Clayton Community Church. We encourage you as believers in your own homes, as you are gathered together in the name of the Lord, to take communion together. Uh, we believe that it, it's good for us as a church to do that together, but we also believe it's important as every believer that you do that as well. It's not completely dependent upon clergy to lead you in communion. But rather, Christ says, whenever you do this, whenever you get together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're breaking bread together, you're in fellowship with other believers, it is good to remember what Christ had done on the cross for us. As you're partaking in in your drink and you're breaking your bread together, that you do it in honor and glory of the Lord. And of course, where clergy or pastors or elders come in, in play is to help to lead and guide you and assist you in that process of communion, to find the heart and the meaning of communion. But the whole purpose of communion is in that very word, communion. We're celebrating our unity with Christ and our unity with God the Father, thanks to Christ. So as, we, as we're partaking of the elements together, it's a, it's a symbol and a reminder and a testament of our faith in Him. But it's not an individual thing. It's, it's a community thing. It's a fellowship thing, and that's why it's important that we do it together because it's celebrating our oneness with God, but it celebrates our oneness together in, in Christ. And so as, as we're taking communion, it's really something that when we look around at one another, we are encouraged by each other's faith. As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, he, he longed to be with the Roman church so that he can impart to them the spiritual blessing of common faith. And that's something that we can only find when we come together, when we're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is the example he gives, that when you come together, you are honoring Christ together. And then he also gives a a Jewish example. He talks about the altar at the temple, the altar 
the sacrifices of the Jews. And in a similar way, like communion for the Jews, when they would travel to Jerusalem to the temple and they would offer up the sacrifices according to the law, it wasn't simply that this act of faith that they were doing. Yes, that was absolutely a part of it. But it was also about their unity as a people. That when they came together and they celebrated these feasts, when they were offering sacrifices at the altar, it was about their unity with God as God's people, but it was about their unity together. That we are one nation under God, and we are doing acts of religious practice in his name. And so he uses both the Gentile example of communion, the Jewish example of the sacrifices at the altar. But then he also gives a pagan example. Now, pagans, non-believers, they don't take communion because they don't believe. They don't sacrifice offerings in the same way because they don't believe. But they do have their own rituals and practices which bring them unity in their community. And many of these practices um, have to do with sinful ideas, especially idolatry, uh, but also sexual immorality, gluttony, etc., coming together in the name of whatever it is that they're doing. And usually it's absent of God. But yet there's still community there. And, and they find encouragement and enjoyment together because they're not alone in what they're doing. They're not alone in their unbelief, or they're not alone in their idolatry, or their sexual immorality. And so they come together and they unity together in that way. And so the whole point of, of Paul bringing this together is that when we come together and we're doing any kind of activities together, whether it's trap shooting, whether it's potlucks or uh, like women's retreats or things like that, whatever we're doing as believers, it's important that we're unified around righteous activity. And so Paul brings this up because he mentions the fact that, that there are some people who are weaker than other people. There are some believers who are more mature than other believers. There are some believers who are able to make nuance and, uh, and make distinction between eating a meal that somebody else prepared in a pagan way but sold it in the meat market. You bought it, you ate it, you gave glory to God and thanks to God for it. There's a difference between that and between participating in a ceremony where you are actively a part of that idolatry and a part of sacrificing this meat to a false god. There's a difference between the two. And so recognizing this, Paul wants the church to be unified in our understanding of what the Word of God says. So we must not play under thunderstorms is what I'm trying to say. As believers, we need to be able to understand where it's okay to play and where it's okay not to play. And I was happy to hear that the men's, uh, the men's group who was shooting the shotguns, that they recognize at a certain point, we need to get undercover. Because uh, the whole joke along the way was, well, you better not shoot off somebody's face like Dick Cheney did. You know, that was the joke leading up to it, where, you know, we're going to be careful. But I don't think anybody was thinking about thunderstorms before that day. But then it came, and the men were wise enough to flee and seek shelter. And as believers, we need to be wise enough to know when sin, when sin is influencing the church and when we need to flee as a church. We need to know what cloud cover is okay to play under. And we need to know which is not okay. But the fact is that we are weak and sometimes we don't possess the capability to, to resist assimilation through association. That, that sometimes there are, are some people who can't disassociate certain activities or certain foods with certain sins. And the thing is that sometimes this doesn't always translate perfectly into practical living, and especially in a Gentile world where there's sin and idolatry all around us. I mean, being American, it's kind of hard to live in this world, trade in the marketplace, find leisure and enjoyment without coming across some kind of 
pagan, sinful, idolatrous ritual or practice, right? I mean, it's hard to trade in the marketplace if you took the perspective of, I am only going to trade with those who have the same faith as me. It would be really hard in this country to do that. In Jerusalem, it would have been different. They were a theocracy. Their, their entire system of living was built upon the law or the word of God. Whereas here in America, we are a Gentile nation. Uh, we were built upon biblical principles, but still there's, there's a lot of freedom for people to sin or believe differently. And, you know, we, we enjoy the liberty that we have to believe the way that we believe, but there are those who are in the public sector who don't believe anything that we believe. In fact, they believe the opposite. And so it, it's really hard to, to manage sometimes uh, the practical way we live versus how we're trying to prevent sin from creeping into our families and into our churches. And so knowing that, Paul goes in the next section when we look at verses 23 through 30, Paul knows that as believers, we need to understand the nuances of liberty and our conscience. And so he says, using a line from the Corinthians, all things are lawful. Okay, this was a popular platitude that the Corinthians like to use. They used it earlier. Paul referenced it earlier. All things are lawful because we live in liberty of Christ. We have Christian liberty. All things are lawful. We can do just about anything we want so long as it's not a clear violation. And so Paul answers that platitude with, but not all things are helpful. So yes, you have Christian liberty, but not to the point where you can offend a fellow believer or you can harm another believer who has a weaker conscience than you. And so God calls on us to be helpful. And sometimes this means that we bear the burdens of another person's weaker conscience. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This doesn't just mean help somebody carry their firewood. This doesn't just mean come over and cry on someone's shoulder, or let them cry on, on your shoulder, bear their burdens. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. Mourn with people who mourn. Rejoice with those who rejoice. But it also means to be considerate of where people might be weak based off of former associations that they might have had. The clear and obvious example, of course, is alcoholism. Many people in this country uh, have been plagued, maybe even some of you have been plagued by alcoholism. And that's something that you've been trying for a long time to overcome, recover from, and with God's help, you have made much progress. But also, it means that it's something that is a sensitive topic to you. That there might be a, a certain trigger that might set you off that another fellow believer might not even know about. You know, somebody sees you at a local bar, parked out, you know, your car is parked out in front of the local bar, and that might be all the trigger they need to fall back into their alcoholism. And maybe you don't know that, maybe you do, but we're called to, to be helpful. Because we know what the scripture says, that it's not a sin to drink fermented drink or to drink alcohol. It is a sin to drink excessively and to become drunk with wine or drunk with alcohol. And so there is a, a liberty there, but there's also a gray line there. Because we're also told to be considerate of our neighbor, to be considerate of our fellow believer. To try and get to know people to the point where you know if somebody has an issue. To be careful about where you drink or who you drink with, and obviously especially how much you drink. And so, yes, you are free. All things are lawful. You're free to drink alcohol, but it's not always helpful to drink alcohol. And you need to be careful about who you're drinking around or with or how much. And then he also, he repeats the same line, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. God calls on us to build each other up. And those who are strong in the faith and have the love of God in increasing measure will feel a growing burden to build your fellow believer up. Romans 15, 1 through 2 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. 
So as you grow in your faith, and you, as you grow in your maturity, and you, as you grow in your ability to be able to nuance uh, out the, the good parts and the bad parts, you also grow in your burden to build your, your fellow believer up. And sometimes that involves forfeiting your own Christian liberty for the sake of somebody else. Because Paul says very explicitly, we are to seek the good of our neighbor. And the point that Paul is trying to make is not that we should needlessly live a life of asceticism, which means like removing all pleasurable things from your life. He's not calling us to do that. And he's not calling on us to be ruled by the legalism of somebody else. Because we do know that some people abuse this, um, this doctrine or this feature of Scripture where knowing that, that you need to be considerate of other people, they will then impose upon you every legalistic thing that they have on their conscience and say and project onto you and say that you also need to hold the same view. And if you don't, then you're a sinner. And we saw this through COVID-19, did we not? You know, people using this passage to try and guilt trip other believers into getting the vaccine, even though it was not according to your conscience, but only according to theirs. They felt according to their, their situation, their personal health, they felt getting the vaccine was the right thing to do. Or according to their profession, getting the vaccine was the right thing to do. And if that was their conviction, if that was according to their conscience, God bless you, you do that. But what we found is that even in the church, there were multiple churches that, that I found, especially on the other side of the state, which were publicly denouncing and rebuking churches like ours who didn't require members and people to get the vaccine, to be in fellowship together. And, and they would use this verse and say, you're not being considerate of other people. Well, it works both ways, does it not? They're not being considerate of people who have a conviction that I am young, I am healthy, I, I, my job doesn't require it, I have no need to get it, why would you force me to get it? Especially when we know that having the vaccine, you can still transmit the disease, it, it really makes no difference as far as spreading, so we know that that wasn't true. But you get what I'm trying to say, that yes, we are called to seek the good of our neighbor, but also that we are called to be shrewd and, and not to allow somebody who uses this doctrine to guilt trip you into doing something against your conscience. And that's where wisdom comes in. That's where shrewdness comes in. To know the difference between somebody who genuinely just needs your encouragement, you building them up, versus somebody who's trying to control you. And so Paul, he follows this up by providing us with specific examples of practical wisdom and practical permission when it comes specifically to the topic of eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. And as, as I mentioned before, that's not a, a typical issue that we find ourselves in today, right? I mean, when you're going to the meat market, you're not thinking, I wonder if somebody offered this to an idol. It's, it doesn't run in our modern mindset. But what we do think about, for example, is when we're consuming content, uh, especially on TV or from streaming services. I've, I've heard from many of you that you've canceled your, your Disney account because of what they're doing in Florida and things like that. Uh, you know, so we do run across the same principle where the material or the things that we're consuming, we have to consider where they're coming from, uh, uh, who, who is heading this up and what they believe. I mean, those are all things that cross our mind. In fact, it's interesting because um, before about two or three months ago, I didn't have any of those kind of conversations with people for a while. But then all of a sudden, one person after another, we were just talking about that very principle of, of well, what, what you consume, the entertainment you consume, the food you consume, who you consume it around. It just kept coming up. And so I really appreciate the text, and I don't think it's a, a, um, an accident that God has brought us to this point in the Scripture. And maybe some of you have been dealing with this in your own relationships where people are, are trying to guilt trip you about the, the things that you're consuming or trying to project onto you the things that, that you ought to consume or not to consume. And so Paul gives us practical wisdom here. First, he begins with the public meat market. He talks about how if there's meat that is sold 
uh, in the meat market, uh, eat whatever is sold without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Now, why does he bring that up? Well, because in Corinth, which was a, a very pagan city built upon the Greek culture, especially Greek mythology, and as we talked about also the, the games that were played on the isthmus nearby, the Olympic games that were played, that those were dedicated to the Greek gods. And they would often sacrifice uh, different things to their, their false gods. And, and then uh, people would celebrate the games by eating the meat that was sacrificed there. But then whatever the meat was left over, they would ship it over to Corinth, and, and that would be sold in the public market. And so what Paul is referring to here is, if you're a believer, and you need to feed your family, and there's really only one source of, of food, which is the public market in the city of Corinth, uh, when you go there, just don't ask them where it came from or how it was made. God is going to give you a pass according to ignorance on the, on the subject. And so he says, don't investigate. Don't, don't ask like, well, how, was, was this meat offered to, us, offered to an idol? Was this meat offered to an idol? Who prepared this meat? Don't go into the market saying, I will only eat meat prepared by Christian people. That's what he's saying. Is because of your conscience, just don't ask where it came from. Just go buy the meat, prepare for your family, feed your family. And, and on account of conscience, you are not sinning at that point. And so therefore, Paul's view essentially on this matter is don't worry about it. Don't worry about investigating where it came from for the sake of your conscience. Because God doesn't want to burden the believer with the arduous task of researching every little tiny thing that you do in life. And as we looked at at the beginning of this text, yes, we need to know what sin is and we need to avoid it and flee from it at all costs. But when it comes to trivial matters or matters of indifference as far as what meats you eat or don't eat, God does not want to burden you with that arduous task. I mean, could you imagine that if every little thing that you consumed, every food that you consumed in life, if you had to do research on who prepared it, where it was sold from, and maybe some of you do that because for different reasons, dietary reasons, but it's, it's an arduous task that God doesn't want to burden you with so that you can focus on more important things. Because that's, that's not a salvation issue as far as God is concerned when it comes to Christians. And again, this principle extends beyond the first century marketplace. God doesn't expect you to look at the religious affiliation of every restaurant owner you go to. You want to take your wife out for a night on the town? God doesn't expect you to, to do a deep dive into the history of a restaurant and the CEOs and the founders and the cooks who are in the back and make absolutely sure that they are God-fearing Christian people. God does not expect you to do that. Find a restaurant that is reviewed well, that people don't leave from sick, <laughs> that you know that your spouse is going to like, and take them there. But for, and for the sake of your own... Because con- you, if you did a deep dive on anybody, you're going to find some sin in their background. You're going to find some very scary things on most people. And today, in today's day and age, people's lives are, are um, out in the open. I mean, you, you, you know, you can find a tweet that they made five years ago that would just blow your mind, I'm sure. But we could do a deep dive on anybody. And if your standard is they need to be a, a perfect God-fearing Christian in order for me to consume this meat, you're never going to eat meat the rest of your life if that is your standard. And as believers, we're called to be consistent with our standard too. So if you're going to make that standard about meat, then why not make that standard about salad? Why not make that standard about, about the, the water you drink? Where did it come from? You know, can it only come from a holy place? You know, uh, and you see what I mean. It's an arduous task that God does not want to encumber you with. And so Paul quotes Psalm 24.1, in justifying this, and he says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So, everything belongs to God. Every creature, every green piece of lettuce, that all belongs to God and he gave it to us for our enjoyment, uh, for us to, to be fed, to survive. 
And if somebody prepares it in a way that is ungodly, and you're unaware of it, and you happen to buy it and eat it, you are not sinning. Because ultimately, none of that means anything. It doesn't do anything as far as you're concerned. But then, he brings up the practical situation of what if you're eating at an unbeliever's house? Okay, so that's buying from the public market. But what if an unbeliever invites you to their home? Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a boss, and you have to go, you're dispatched to go. You really have no choice. So, so you go and you sit down and you eat food with them. Paul instructs believers to eat whatever is served. And you know what? That's called manners. If people serve it to you, it's really rude to say, okay, now how did you prepare it? Did you boil it in this? Did you do that? Did you do this? That's just kind of rude, right? If they put it in front, I mean, some cultures are deeply offended by that. If, if you don't accept what they give to you, if you uh, call it into question, but rather you, with Thanksgiving, you receive the meal and you eat it. Obviously, there's a difference if you're allergic or things like that, but you know what I'm saying. When it comes to just basic, somebody is serving you a plate of meat, and you're not a vegetarian, you, you love meat, you eat it. And so Paul is saying, you eat it. But then he also says, if it's made known to you, if they said, yeah, back in the kitchen, I, I sacrificed this, uh, this chicken to Baal, the god that I worship. And, you know, Baal is the only god. And they came out and they made this presentation. This is a Baal sacrifice chicken. Eat with me under the glory of Baal. Okay, if they made a presentation like that, at that point, it'd probably be good to say, well, I worship the only true God, which is Yahweh. And then you start fighting because you're throwing meat at each other. God alone, Baal alone, and you're fighting. Um... But if they make that known to you, then you object. But also you object if there is a fellow believer with you who's weak and doesn't understand the nuances of the fact that what they just did in the kitchen doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean anything to you. In fact, a mature believer might even use that situation to share the gospel with an unbeliever. But if a weak believer is in the same company, then we need to keep that in mind as well. And so Paul gives us these two practical examples of theology into practical living. In other words, in such an area of the public market, or if you're invited to an unbeliever's house, this is the, these are the nice clouds that you can play under. But when it comes to a weaker brother, those are the dangerous clouds that you need to then flee from and, and call people out of. And so we're called to be considerate of other believers. And Paul asks the question, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Again, he, he's trying to make this balance and this nuance of, yes, we are opposed to idolatry. Um, and, and yes, we do have Christian liberty. But somewhere in the middle, we have to approach with wisdom. And some people will try and guilt your conscience. But not every cloud is a cumulus cloud, and some people can't tell the difference. There are some believers who they step outside and they see cloud cover. And even if it's not cumulus clouds, they think, there could be thunder and lightning, I'm going inside. But you as a wise person, you look and you say, there's nothing wrong with those clouds. Those are not cumulus clouds, we're, we're okay. But for them, it's... No, I, I, I had a bad experience with thunder and lightning one time, and any cloud, every cloud scares me, and I'm running inside. Well, think of this scenario. You're, you're spending time with some friends, and one person is of that persuasion, and suddenly clouds come rolling in. None of, us, none of them are dark and dangerous. They're just regular old clouds, fluffy clouds. And then suddenly they say, it, it could possibly rain. It could possibly thunder and lightning, so I'm going inside now. And the rest of you, I mean, imagine if you were out doing the, the shooting and the first sign of any cloud, somebody's like, we can't shoot out of here. Uh, we can't shoot out of here. We're going to get struck by lightning right off the bat. Well, the, the wiser people know that we're, we're perfectly safe. But if that person says, I'm going inside, well, perhaps the, the good Christian thing to do would be, you know what, I, 
I know it's not a danger for us, but I'm going inside with you because I want to be with you. That's kind of what being considerate looks like. And then if you're in another situation where the group, under, all, everybody in the group understands there's no danger in these clouds, then you can stay outside, you can enjoy your time together. And so you, you see the difference between being considerate versus living in liberty versus understanding the nuance of situations. Okay, what, what if all this is still confusing to people? What if you're not sure wh- where's the line of idolatry? Where's the line of, of entertaining demons or demonic activity? Uh, when are you letting things into your life that you shouldn't let into your life? When in doubt, imitate those who best imitate and glorify Christ. Verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that um, of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. The top priority of every believer should be to glorify God with your life, with the words that you say and the things that you do. And if you participating in your Christian liberty does not bring glory to God because it causes another brother to stumble, then we should stop doing that thing. Because everything we do needs to glorify God and bring Him glory. And this doesn't always mean that you forfeit your liberty, but when it's appropriate to do so, that you willingly do it because you know it brings God glory to look out for other brothers and sisters who have weaknesses in particular areas. Be a pleasing vessel for the sake of the gospel. And Paul here, he's he's referring to an old statement he made in 922, where he says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Again, that was his highest priority, was the salvation of unbelievers, the building up of weaker believers. And he was willing to forfeit all of his Christian liberty if that's what it took for them to grow. And that should be our mindset as well. Why? Because it was the mindset of Christ. How much liberty do you think Jesus had when he walked on earth? Could he have done just about anything he wanted to uh, apart from sin? Yeah. Do you think when uh, they were they were mocking him on the cross and said, hey, hey, if you're really the son of God, why don't you call on the, uh, the armies of heaven to come down and pull you off this cross, huh? If you're really Jesus, the son of God, you would do that. Do you think Jesus had the freedom to do that? You betcha he did. But you know why he didn't? Because he was meek. Christ the Lord was meek. And some people view meekness as weakness, but it's actually the exact opposite. Meekness is the highest degree of strength that you can have. Because meekness is ultimately being able to do something, but having the discipline and the will and the power to hold it back. Meaning, yeah, he could have called down the angels of heaven and wiped out every single person on planet earth as he was hanging on the cross. He had the power to do that. But because of meekness, he held it back. Why? Because his his intention wasn't to wipe everybody out. It was to bring salvation to the world. And so in meekness, he held back that particular power so that he can die and through a different kind of power provide salvation to the world. So God is calling on us, the church, to be meek. Do you have the freedom to go enjoy a nice beverage with your wife? Yes, you do. You have that Christian freedom. But do you have the meekness to hold back that freedom for the sake of a weaker brother or sister? That's the question we're asking this morning. And if you're unsure about the particulars of the certain things, then Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. God has provided us with the church, which is a body of believers, which includes a wide variety of of different people in the faith. Those who are new in the faith and might be immature, not, might not be able to distinguish between dark clouds and light clouds. 
And then those who have been in the faith for a long time, who have stumbled and falled, you know, sinners saved by grace, who have found out the hard way what the difference is between dark and light clouds, and who have learned to, to, um, to hone in their life, uh, to really just uh, hone in their life in, in good and righteous ways, to where they, they know how to make nuance between, yeah, th- this meat is good meat for eating. And why should I let the sins of someone else bother me and my family from eating this meat? Because it means nothing what they did. But we can enjoy it. My conscience is clear. And so God is calling on the church, on, on you, to look to living examples of people who live like Christ. And in order to do this, you need to know the Word of God because you, you need to know who Christ is. And you can't know who Christ is unless you read the Word of God. The Word of God is his revelation to us to teach us about who Christ is and what he did, about salvation and how to live righteously. And so when, when you find believers who, based off of the best of your knowledge of the Word of God, live like Christ, obviously not perfectly, none of us will, but those who with regular consistency live as Christ, make decisions based off of the way the Holy Spirit is leading them, based off of the character of Christ, When you find such people in your life, imitate their life. And when it comes to these gray area matters where you you don't really know and the Bible isn't exactly clear, go ask one of these people, what would you do in this situation? Because God has given us the church for that very reason, to help us navigate through this life, to navigate the storms and to, to be able to know the difference between that cloud and that cloud. And so... I want to leave you with that today. I want to encourage you to join us and stay for Soup Fellowship. And as you're here, if you have anything on your mind, you know, talk about this stuff. Talk about the content you're consuming on, on your television. Talk about the, the food that you're eating or, or the drinks that you're drinking. Talk about those things. Ask each other, what, what's your position on this? You know, should, should believers watch Harry Potter? Should, uh, should believers drink in public, you know, at a public restaurant. Talk about these things. Iron sharpening iron. And come to a better understanding of these things together. And I want to invite you guys to come back next week. My brother Brad Coe is going to be delivering the sermon. Uh, It's Palm Sunday next week. Uh, So come come and enjoy a great sermon from Brad. Uh, Then the week after that, we have Easter. It's already here. That's crazy to me. Uh, But we're going to celebrate those things, enjoy those things together. But let's pray, and uh, we'll enjoy some soup together today. In Jesus' name, we love you. We thank you, God, for, for all the many blessings that you give us. We thank you for the unity that we find together in communion, in fellowship. We thank you that, God, we can be united and encouraged by each other's faith. I pray, God, that on these matters of indifference and trivial things that we wrestle with in our modern culture, that you will help us to heed your word. You will help us to, to find those, those different places of, of nuance where we do have freedom. But then you would also, Lord, show us where we need to be sensitive towards other people's weaknesses. God, we, do, we just want to live in unity. We want to be in peace with one another. We want to do what's right. We want to not stray into the storms. But God, we want to we be in a safe place to play. So help us to find those areas of freedom and liberty. And help us, Lord, to to know uh, who we need to be careful around. God, we're just trusting in you, trusting in your word and your Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you for this time we get to spend. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.